Welcome to Disciple Dojo. This afternoon, I got to have a great chat with Dr. Carol Kaminsky, Old Testament professor at my alma mater, Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary up in South Hamilton, Massachusetts. And she is also the author of the Story of God Bible Commentary on First and Second Chronicles, as well as a study called Casket Empty. It was a great discussion. I love sitting and talking with Old Testament scholars, people whose work I've benefited from over the years. There was even a cameo by our Disciple Dojo Old Testament Timeline Overview, which, by the way, if you want one of these, you can get it along with other cool Bible nerdy gifts in our Disciple Dojo online store. I'll put a link to that on the screen here as well as in the video description. The only reason I'll point that out is because in this episode, we were talking about the Old Testament narrative timeline, specifically how it's laid out in Chronicles. Chronicles are those books that a lot of people know are in the Bible, but they've never actually read. They may be able to quote a specific verse, if my people who are called by my name, blah, 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 but they don't know the context in which that verse is given. So it was cool having Dr. Kaminsky on to talk about why Christians even need to read Chronicles in the first place. Why does it matter? What does it have to teach us? I hope you enjoy this episode. If you do, one of the best ways you can show your support for these type of long form interviews is just by clicking the subscribe button. And when you do hit that little bell icon that tells YouTube, Hey, I want to see when more content is coming out on this channel. We're going to be doing a live stream this week. And the only way you'll know about when we do the live streams are if you have notifications enabled. And our live streams are when I do open Q and A's, we give away biblical resources, study Bibles, things like that. So I can post about them on the feed and I can share them on our social media. But honestly, that still is gonna be hit or miss whether you see it or not. But if you enable notifications, YouTube is like, oh, this person wants to know when new content is out. So all of that to say, it really matters, not just when you subscribe, but when you enable notifications. All right, sit back and enjoy this conversation with Dr. Carol Kaminsky. Dojo viewers, you are in for a treat today. We are joined by Dr. Carol Kaminsky. And I'm excited to have her on for a couple of reasons, one of which being she is a professor at my alma mater at Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. So I would like to hear from you. Um, Carol, how'd you end up? How does an Australian end up in New England teaching the Bible? Give, give us a little bit of that journey and, and what you're doing now, what your official capacity is, and just let viewers get to know who you are a little bit. Yeah, well, it's great to be here. So, yeah, Australian, you can hear from the accent, not from Boston. <laughs> and uh, so about 30 years ago, I was had been studying at a Bible college in Australia, and there was a faculty member, Ricky Watts, who was a graduate from Gordon-Conwell, and he was also did teaching at Regent. And um, so he was teaching back there. I took one class with him. And I absolutely loved it. It was Isaiah's New Exodus in Mark. Mm. I know it sounds kind of like, well, would that be that exciting? But I think it was the first time I really put the Bible together. Uh -huh. So I had planned on going to Bible college for one year, took his class, and then it was just like, oh, okay, I need more of this. And so I took other classes and then I'm doing Greek and then Hebrew and then uh, was looking at doing further study, really felt God was calling me. And he, he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to study the Bible. And he goes, you need to go to Gordon Conwell. So that was that was how I got there. And uh, about 30 years ago, I uh, was studying there and just loved it and then went on to do further study from um, after Gordon Conwell. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about just we won't spend a ton of time, but I do because I was at Gordon Conwell in the Hamilton campus for two years. I started my uh -huh. seminary there. Uh, my parents, my dad went to seminary there. And when I was in my mom's belly, that he wow. was taking classes. Uh, so the the New England campus in particular is near and dear to my heart. But what would give me one thing that has been sort of a, a culture shock to someone coming from down under and then living in New England? Yeah. What, what was one of the what was a big difference? You, I, I noticed some as a Southerner moving up there. Yeah, and I, I, bet, I bet you did. Um, but what did you what stood out to you as an Australian yeah. about New England, and good guess, or bad? Yeah, being a Southerner, you probably identify with this as well. But <laughs> Australians tend to be um, it's a drop in culture. It's informal. Mm -hmm. And 
New England is not like that. <laughs> so, you know, New Englanders, I mean, they they you can be very good friends with them, but it takes a long time to get a dinner invitation. <laughs> so, yeah. And you sort of plan it a few months out, mm. whereas Australia is drop-in culture. Mm-hmm. Oh, you happen to be coming by, doesn't matter what time, just stop by. So, right. so I think that was the biggest one, getting used to, um, and of course, the winter, let's put it that, the snow. Right. Yeah. Uh, I really haven't quite got used to the snow. I've been here for many years now and try and do something during the snow if I can, mm-hmm. as in get away. <laughs> so <laughs> this this past um, winter, I was in uh, Thailand for a couple of weeks teaching and then in Argentina as well. And so that was, they'd asked me, when would you like to come? And I'm like, oh, January, February. <laughs> So. <laughs> New England winter. That's when I want to be down there. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Well, what did you after you studied at Gordon Conwell? You went on for PhD work. Uh, yeah. Where did you Where did you do your PhD, and what was your uh, focus in your dissertation? Yeah, so I went on to Cambridge University, and I worked with uh, under Robert Gordon. Mm-hmm. So in Old Testament, and I was originally going to be working in Ezekiel, and I was looking at the new creation theme in Ezekiel. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I did some work in Genesis 1 to 11 with my supervisor because I was looking at the whole creation and kind of curse against the ground, and I ended up staying in Genesis. Mm -hmm. And I looked at the creation blessing uh, where it says, be fruitful and multiply, and really wanting to see how is that blessing being fulfilled in the book of uh, Genesis. And it's a really interesting study just to see how the creation kind of connects with Abrahamic promises and so on. So I loved, loved my time there. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was finishing up a seminary, um, knowing I I never had you for a class, but I knew, uh, obviously I knew of your work and I knew that Genesis was a a focus of yours. Um, I didn't know that it was what you had done. I mean, I didn't know anybody's doctoral dissertation at that point. I was just trying to finish my MDiv. But yeah. uh, then when I found out, I found out last year that you had done uh, the volume on First and Second Chronicles in the Story right. of God Bible Commentary Series. And that piqued my interest. I actually, I actually got this copy. I picked it up at SBL uh, last right. year. And I, this is not a paid endorsement, folks. I bought this with my own money. Uh, but I I bought it because I one there's not a ton out there for um, non technical audiences when it comes to commentaries yeah. on chronicles and the story of God series is one that I think is accessible to interested Bible mm-hmm. readers without necessarily having to know Greek and Hebrew and all of right. that viewers you if you haven't seen our interviews we've interviewed a number of people who've contributed to this series so. Uh, our friend Nijay Gupta did a, yeah. a Galatians volume in the New Testament. Paul Evans did First and Second Samuel. Um, uh, Jay Sklar just released his that's on Numbers. Right. So we've had a number of people from this series, and that's another reason that I wanted to have you in. Um, yeah, just to to get some insight on Chronicles. We had um, Nancy Dawson was on recently talking about genealogies in the Bible, and one of the things that we joked about was. Chronicles just wears people out when they first try to start reading it. Oh, it's brutal. <laughs> and those opening chapter, I mean, like, a, I don't know, a third of the book, or not maybe a third, yeah. a fourth of the book, a chunk of the book <laughs> yeah. are genealogies. And so I want to get your take. Um, I want to mention two of your work. The other book, and I'm saying this now for my own benefit, so I know we'll get to it, is you've also done a study called Casket, and then there's a New Testament yep. uh, corresponding course called Empty. We're going to talk about this because I I do want people to know about this resource. I've recommended it here in Disciple Dojo videos a number of times. But before we do that, I'd like to start with Chronicles if we can, and then work our way into that. Um, So what I want you you say, and I, I love the quote, it's right on page one of your commentary. And you say, uh, I have it here on my screen, it'll be easier to read, that the book of Chronicles is not for the faint of heart but it is for the thirsty. That's mm-hmm. a great quote. And those first opening chapters, because so many people see them as very dry, uh, the yeah. thirsty image is an apt one. What do you mean by that quote? Unpack that a little bit to the viewer yeah. who is like, well, I've read Samuel, I've read Kings. They were kind of hard. And Chronicles just seems like a harder version of those to get right. into. Change their mind. 
<laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so first of all, why did I choose Chronicles? Because this one of the things I loved about Chronicles was, you know, there's kings like Jehoshaphat. If you've read about the stories of, there's several chapters about him, but this is the king who, you know, the enemies are coming against him and he, he prays, he fasts, he seeks God, he falls flat on his face, mm. and there's this incredible prayer and trusting. So I always love that story. And there's King Asa, who is another one who just kind of seeks God and relies upon God. So I was really intrigued by these stories. Mm. And I also have think, you know, I've read commentaries on Chronicles. Um, some of them are that technical that you might even like Chronicles before you start and you read the technical one and are like, I thought I used to like Chronicles, right? It puts you off. <laughs> right. So so that's why I was, I, I thought I'm really, we need to be talking about the kings of Israel and we need to be talking about these stories because they have incredible relevance for our lives. Mm. And here's just one little piece of that. What does it mean in terms of for those who are thirsty? Um the listeners may be surprised to know that the verb to seek the face of God occurs more often in Chronicles than in any other Old Testament book, mm. over 40 times, even more than in the Psalms. Wow. But what you find in Chronicles is there are themes like prayer, seeking the face of God, crying out to God for help, trusting in God, all these wonderful themes that I think have got um, really uh relevant for our lives today because mm. God's people at the time when Chronicles was written, they were really struggling. They'd been on a huge transition. There was no king on the throne. They're under Persia. And what this author is doing under the spirit of God is calling people back to the essentials of the faith and calling them to things like prayer, seeking God, crying out to God for help, trusting in him. And so I think uh, my goal for the commentary was really to make that accessible for people. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that when Chronicles was written, so briefly uh, give viewers just how do we situate that in history? It's post-exilic, right. immediately post-exilic yeah. or parts. Yeah, so I like to think of it. Uh, I like to think of it, it's within the last 100 years of the Old Testament. So usually there's, you know, that 400 years between the Testaments. So if you think of it, it's in that last 100 before that 400 years between the Testaments. So, but the big uh, thing to remember with Chronicles is that God's people have gone back. They'd been in exile in Babylon. They've gone back into Jerusalem and they have to rebuild their whole lives. Mm -hmm. uh, we know from a, a one uh, banking company that lend up to 40% interest. We know that the mm. price of huge inflation, doesn't right. that sound familiar? Yeah, <laughs> right? I that. Uh, you know, so they're struggling with the, some of them have lost their houses. So you could think of housing foreclosures, you know, these kind of issues. And they've got to um, think about their own identity. Who are they in light of this huge Persian empire? And so there's wonderful lessons in this during this final time period to really come back to what's important in the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. So then Chronicles recaps uh, to a certain degree, a lot of first and second Kings, first and second Samuel, but it's, but it's very different. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times people that, you know, like I said, by the time they've read through Kings, uh, Samuel yeah. and Kings, they're kind of historyed out. And because Chronicles is put in our English Bibles right after that, they're just right. like, oh, great, this again. Whereas in Jewish Bibles, the order is different. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about that and where, where Chronicles sits in the Jewish canon or canons or places, because I know there's sure. a little bit of discrepancy. Yeah, so in, in our English Bible, we have um, First and Second Chronicles is coming after Kings. So it's in the, in the historical books. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the Jewish, but not all manuscripts, I will say that, but in the um, Jewish text, it's coming at the end. So it's kind of like this, and the last few verses invites people to go back to Jerusalem, right? right? The call. So it kind of finishes with this call and invitation to go back into Jerusalem. So, but I, I think you're right. When you have it coming after Kings, people are already weary of it. And Kings is actually a little bit more on the discouraging side, right? <laughs> a bit. Because Kings, I chose Chronicles for a reason. <laughs> so <laughs> Kings 
is going to focus both on the northern and the southern kingdom, mm. whereas Chronicles tends to focus more on the south. It focuses on Jerusalem, prayer, the tribe of Judah. So there's a lot of themes in it that are not in uh, Kings. And there's, for example, Jehoshaphat. There's much more about Jehoshaphat, about him in Chronicles than there is in Kings. Um, there's more about King Hezekiah. And, and there's also these little mini sermonettes peppered throughout Chronicles, including even in the genealogies, mm. that are calling us to think about the stories and how they apply to our lives. Mm. Well, the title itself, Chronicles, is um, it's it's an apt title, as you say in your commentary introduction, but it wasn't the only title uh, that the book ever had. How did right. we get that term, Chronicles? It's When you open the Septuagint, it's called one thing. Hebrew Bible, it's yep. called another thing. What's going on with the name, and how does that... That is even the title of the book condition right. how we approach it. Right. Yeah. So so the Hebrew is kind of events of days, mm. which sounds doesn't sound too interesting, but it is kind of a um, language that's used for archives. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's similar to Chronicles, like sort of archives, if you like. Mm. Um, but then uh, what we do have also is, so there's two different traditions here. So you have the... Um, Greek tradition, which called it kind of things left out, mm -hmm. which is not so positive. And what, but, but at the same time, what they're trying to say is, oh, Chronicles has additional information that's not in Kings, mm -hmm. right? So what it was left out of Kings is in, there's extra information in Chronicles. Uh, but that's also not where we get our English. The English actually comes from Jerome, uh, fourth century, and from the Vulgate, with his use, this term chronicon, and that seems to have gone back to the Jewish targums. Mm. So, so you've really got that, uh, and then it was influenced in terms of with Luther, Luther's um, designation. So, I think Chronicles is appropriate, recognizing it. It's not the same as what is in both the Hebrew and the Greek translation, mm. but it is chronicling, if you like, the history of. Um, God's people, especially the kings. Mm. And uh, Jerome talks about chronicling the sacred history, and I think that's very nice as well. Mm. So tell us a little bit, I, in, in page, on pages uh, 16 and 17 in your commentary, you talk about the, those opening genealogies and the, how they present a world map Yep. Um, how they're laying out. And this is one of the things we've, in our episode with Nancy Dawson, we talked about the importance of genealogies and why they matter yep. and how to read them as literary devices, not yep. as seeking mathematical precise calculations of right. ages or things like that. But what do you, wh what is there to gain from the opening genealogy being a world map of sorts? Uh, why is that important? Yeah. Why does that matter? Yeah, I think it's helpful to get the big sweep of the genealogy. So you've got nine chapters of genealogies. And so mm -hmm. what's the big sweep? Uh, I think the first thing to remember is it goes back to Adam, right? Which if you think about it, if you wanted to do a history of kings, why, why go back to Adam? Mm -hmm. And not only does it go back to Adam and it traces the genealogies from Genesis 5 and 11. So it goes from Adam to Abraham and then to Israel. Mm -hmm. But it also includes this table of nations. We call that in Genesis chapter 10, which is where you have 70 nations. So why does it do that? So it is giving you the cosmic. If you think about the time period, the Persian Empire, they are living with nations all around them. Mm -hmm. uh, this small province of Judah, they don't have the same territory as they used to have. They're a smaller territory, province of Judah within the Persian Empire, and You've, you've got the presence of the table of nations in the opening chapter, and you've got this linear genealogy. So what does that mean? What it means is the chronicler is saying that the calling of God from the beginning of creation is being taken up with Israel, his people, and it is being done on a world map the, within the global. So one of the words I like, the phrase I like to use is that God is calling his people to be a worshipping and witnessing people among the nations. Mm. And that's really their calling because there's a sense that the nations are all around them. But if they are seeking God, prayer, worship, 
that the nations are going to be drawn into the presence of God. Mm -hmm. And just as one illustration of how the genealogies with the nations at the beginning kind of connect to the book, the theology, uh, in the temple narrative that is described uh, with King Solomon, there is what we call this inclusio at the beginning and at the end. It's like this little kind of structure and it's got um, a foreigner, the king of Tyre, praising God, and you've got the queen of Sheba. So it's like this little envelope structure. And what's in between? The temple and prayer and worship. And what it's signaling is that the temple prayer worship is these, you do that well and you praise God and you seek him that the nations are going to be drawn to praise God as well. Right. So the opening genealogy with the table of nations is reminding us that their story is being lived out in the cosmic realm. That's such a great insight that that people may easily miss skimming through genealogies of hard to pronounce names, not yeah. seeing the structure. But it really does. I mean, it's the it goes back to the call of Abraham and the culmination right. of God's blessings is in you or through you or by you, all the nations of the earth. That's right. They'll experience the blessing. So Chronicles is that's that's a neat insight that that I don't want viewers to miss is yeah. Chronicles is reaching all the way back to Genesis and yeah. grounding. This is not just a story about some kings in a city in the ancient Near East. Uh, that's right. It's a bigger meta narrative stretching bigger, all the way to and Revelation. You, and you know that yourself when you know, in our even in our particular context now, we're struggling with the issue of identity, right? Mm -hmm. And when you are in the Christ, our context, we feel like we're having less and less impact in the culture, and it's becoming more secular or even more pagan. And it makes you feel like, well, what is God doing? Is God doing anything? Mm -hmm. And Chronicle says, yes, he is. Mm -hmm. Because they went through the same thing. Here we are. We've got less land than we used to have. There's no king on the throne. It looks like God's not at work. And the chronicler is basically saying, God is at work. This is a new season in which you're living, and he is fulfilling his creation purposes through you. And I would argue that's an important message for us. We need to go back to the scriptures for our identity, mm. right, and go back to the, and, and to know that, no, God is at work, even though it might not look that way. We need to look for signs for the kingdom. Absolutely. And speaking of identity, perfect segue, you on page 14, you're talking about the the overall structure and the focus of the chronicler. Yeah. And you make this key point I'd like for you to unpack. You said the chronicler has not lost sight of the northern tribes, for they yeah. constitute, quote, all Israel, a key term that speaks of unity and common ancestry. And so this is something that um, I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on it and, and what you meant by that and, and how it relates to, I mean, I have my own ideas, but I'm have you on because I want to hear from an expert. What do you mean by yeah. all Israel? Why is it significant? Let me say this. Why is it significant that all Israel is not just Judah, yeah. that, that there's more to it than that? Yeah, that's great. So this is one of the reasons why you have nine chapters of genealogies mm. because the chronicler is including the northern tribes as well, which is kind of a little bit surprising when you think of that because of their history. Remember 722, uh, you have, I mean, they've been the apostate kingdom as well. You've got the idolatry for so many years. And then they also, um, the Assyrians come and, you know, take, um, deport people and Samaria gets defeated. But what the chronicler, again, it's coming back to their identity. God has called his people Israel, mm -hmm. and therefore that is part of the vision of the people of God. So he's including these other tribes. So in the beginning, but there's also times here you see the theology of the genealogies being played out in the narratives. Just one example is that during the time of King Hezekiah, after the northern kingdom has kind of come to an end, that there is a story of Hezekiah inviting northern tribes, even after the Assyrian dispersion, mm. and he calls them and they humble themselves. There's that key verse in Chronicles, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray and seek right. my face, 2 Chronicles 7.14. That theology of 2 Chronicles 7.14 is actually um, all the vocabulary is in this story of Hezekiah. And what is it about? It is him inviting the Northerners to be part of the Passover. 
And there's this wonderful um, way that this prayer is being played out within this story and Hezekiah prays for them and there's healing. And then you see at the end of that chapter that the northerners and the southerners are worshipping together. And here's the fun thing. Even some of the people who'd been deported to the northern kingdom, Mm -hmm. They follow them and they come with them. So it looks so you've got this multi-ethnic people of God. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to this expression, all Israel, it is saying it's not only Judah, it's not only Benjamin mm-hmm. or Levi. God had a plan from the beginning that there would be this people of God. Uh, you could think of the prophets Ezekiel. There won't be two kingdoms, but there'll be one kingdom, a united people of God. Mm-hmm. And within that ethnic groups outside of Israel are even included in all Israel. Right. That's a huge point to make. And the the reason that I pointed out is because a lot of times it gets overlooked that even in the Hebrew Bible, Israel was not a homogenous ethnic unit. There, There have always been, I mean, two of the tribes are half Egyptian. That's right. You've got, I always tell people 50% of the adults that left Egypt and made it to Canaan are Gentile. Uh, mm-hmm. There's only two, so it's not a big number, but but you know, Joshua and Caleb, Caleb was Kenizzite, um, yeah. grafted in, to use Paul's That's language, wrong. grafted into the people, to the tribe of Judah. That's and wrong. you talk about that um, specifically, a theme in Chronicles, it's uh, page 44, when you're going through these genealogies and you get to Judah. You point yeah. out a number of times where Gentiles or people who are supposed to be on the outs are yeah. specifically linked to the tribe of Judah. Why is that important? I think that's incredibly insightful and meaningful, and I, I hope people understand and, and wrestle with that. Um, what? How does that shape how we look at and think about Old Testament and New Testament concepts of Israel? Yeah, it- that was a that was actually a surprise to me when I came across that in looking at the tribe of Judah. And there's a scholar called um, Gary Knoppers, K N O P E R S, a scholar who's done a lot of work in that. Um, and Scott Hahn is someone else who's done work in it. And what they have noticed is that within the tribe, you have a number of marriages to non-Israelites that are specifically recorded. And there are also um, uh, going right back from the right back from the beginning with Judah and being his wife being a Canaanite that you have um this idea that the Abrahamic promises, creation, remember we said the genealogies go from Adam. And it takes us all through to Abraham. And then it comes to Israel, but then it's coming to Judah, right? That's kind of this climax. And I think what it is communicating to us is that God's plan that there would be a multi-ethnic people of God, all Israel, including the nations, that this is being fulfilled through Judah in particular. Mm -hmm. And my own work has been in um, Genesis as well. And what's interesting in Genesis, to your point, is that I don't think people really recognize that Joseph's wife was Egyptian and their kids were half Egyptian. Right. And not only that, but they get to be two of the tribes. Yeah. So, I mean, isn't that fascinating? Yeah. Yeah. There's always been, uh, you say, I'll read specifically on page 47, you say, sometimes there's the parentheses, false assumption that the Old Testament is exclusively Jewish, whereas the New Testament is open to people from all nations. But this misinterprets the redemptive storyline of the entire Old Testament, and it misses a key emphasis in the presentation of the tribe of Judah in Chronicles, which underscores that foreigners have been incorporated into the line of Judah. And then it goes on the, the payoff, the kingdom being established through David's line ultimately anticipates the Messiah whose kingdom is comprised of both Jew and Gentile. Do you see this as what Paul is building on in like Romans 9 through 11, particularly Romans 11, when he talks about the tree and branches being grafted and and then he culminates with, and in this way, 
all Israel will be saved. Do you That's think right. he's drawing from Chronicles? Um, I, I don't know if it's specifically from Chronicles, but I do know that, um, you know, already in Genesis, right from the beginning, there is the theology that not all Israel is Israel. Mm -hmm. So there's, so, and especially it comes up with Isaac and Ishmael. Ishmael is the son of Abraham. Um, the term for son is used both of Ishmael and Isaac. But as you know, it says that through um, Isaac, your seed shall be named. Right. And then you come to Genesis 22 and he says, you know, take your son, your only son. And you're like, hang on, he has another son. Right. But it is so it's so that in that sense, there's a narrowing of the children of Abraham are actually going to be children of promise. Mm -hmm. So that's. And you also see then within the storyline that this idea of Israel already in the Old Testament included um, the uh, Gentiles as well. So I think there is a theology that runs through it. Um, a good example is when you have Passover. Again, Passover is very Jewish, right? Uh, so how do you, what about the foreigners who are in your midst? Well, if they get circumcised, they're in. <laughs> they become part of the people of God. And, and so they're the laws themselves will also say, you know, you for the same law for the native as for the foreigner. Mm. And there's that real inclusion that I think we've missed in the church. And I know I've heard some well-known speakers have done teaching on this and have really emphasized, oh, it was really Jewish. And this is why we're under the new covenant. Now, we are under the new covenant, but I think we miss this whole thread, and I think Paul picks mm. it up in Romans as well, mm. uh, redefining Israel in terms of it's not all biological descendants, but it right. is children of faith, Jew and right. Gentile. That in, in popular preaching and teaching, that gets glossed over to an astounding amount. Uh, yeah. And 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 particularly, I'm not even going to get into politics, but just when people yeah. start thinking about world politics and everything, that's right. It's amazing how they they completely miss th Jesus saying things like, you know, or John the Baptist, God can raise up children of Abraham from these rocks. That's right. And and it it just gets linked to this uh, ethnic identity rather than covenant identity. Yeah. That's um, right. So That's I, right. I loved, I actually shared that page, that quote on my Instagram, on Disciple Dojo Instagram, um, it's saying this this is such an important theme. Yeah. More of us need to recognize it, and you could do a whole study on it. But I was, yeah. it was really and, great. Can I just add, yeah, go ahead. Can I just add one last thing? The other thing, too, is, you know, we need to remember that when Abraham's name was changed from Abraham to Abraham, I mean, this is Genesis 17. This is not at the end of the narrative somewhere. From the very beginning, the identity was multi-ethnic. I will make you a father of many nations. Yes. And so and that same chapter, Genesis 17, circumcision, it's all non-Israelites, those who are not your seed who are being circumcised. So I think we need to see this narrative coming right from the book of Genesis. And I think that's why Chronicles is is picking up these stories mm -hmm. and the genealogies to make the same point and the theology is being driven here. Yeah, I, I love it. Viewers, if you're watching and you want to dig deeper into this, start with Genesis, look for all the multi-ethnic uh, instances embedded in the text. Um, Chronicles is there, Ruth, a whole book about it. Ruth, uh, that's right. Yeah, there's just there's so much in there. Uh let me ask you, I want to I want to move on to the um to I want to talk about casket in just a minute. But so this story of God Bible commentary, uh any interested Bible reader could read this. These are written not Correct. for scholars, these are written for preachers, teachers, Sunday school uh yeah. teachers, small group leaders, but it's not thin, and this is a little bit intimidating for some people. So you also have, and I don't have a copy on my end, but you have a Bible study on Chronicles. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. There's the Bible study. <laughs> What's it called? Uh, it is called Cultivating Godliness. Cultivating Godliness. Nice. So cu Cultivating Godliness, people might not think of chronicles when they think of cultivating godliness. Well, they're cultivating patience by getting through yeah. the genealogy. <laughs> so, but in addition to that, what else? How is, how is chronicles uh, is cultivated? So that? let me just share the themes of this. Mm -hmm. Each week, praying to God, prayer, 
seeking God, humbling oneself, listening to wise counsel, seeking God's help, giving generously, singing joyfully to the Lord. Mm. And what I wanted to do with the Bible study was realizing that the commentary could be intimidating, mm. that I wanted to have some other entry points in the Bible study. Right. And uh, so I've done several uh, women's retreats. I have another all church retreat coming up. The cover has been designed to reflect the botanical kind of imagery from the temple. That's actually where it's coming oh, from. Very cool. Uh, because remember that the Jerusalem temple has got all garden imagery on mm -hmm. it. And so that's really where that's coming from. We've got pomegranates on there and mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, but I really wanted to help people to see that if you read the stories of the kings in Chronicles, that you're going to encounter things like prayer all over the place, even in the genealogies, mm -hmm. you're going to encounter what does it mean to seek God? So in the Bible study, one of the weeks is on prayer, and we look at all the different prayers in Chronicles. But then I also talk about, well, what difference does it mean to seek God's face? How is that different from prayer? Because they are different. Mm. So I highlight those things. What does it mean to humble ourselves before God? Because it doesn't mean being a humble person. Right. And so I, I, we explore those, and I even have um, – Hebrew words in transliteration, because I think people want to know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. This channel exists because people want to get into the the Hebrew and the Greek and the... That's right. The, they just, they love that. I think we we do people a disservice by assuming that they are put off by scholarship, when in That's fact, right. it's the opposite. They, they just, they want to be able to get it. It's usually just the cookies are too high on the shelf for them to reach. That's right. That's so right. What's the so structure, I... what's the structure yeah. of the study? Like how many weeks so this, is it, or is so it this, sequentially yeah. or to, thematically? So it's it is an eight week study, mm -hmm. and so the first week is on the introduction to Chronicles, and then uh, it is on those key themes. So it's a thematic study. Okay. Uh, so you're basically going through looking at seeking God's face. As I said, there's over 40 occurrences and there's another verb that's used to do with seeking God. Mm -hmm. I don't look up or you don't go through all this, but you hit some of the main stories. And not only is it going to encourage learning the content of Chronicles, and I've had people say to me, I cannot believe how much I love this material. I cannot believe how much I love it. Mm -hmm. And But then I also want to use it to help people to um, cultivate their own prayer life and walk with God. So I would encourage people to do it in a Bible study. Mm -hmm. uh, some people have done it going through it with their quiet times, uh, just their own personal study. You can do that as well, but a small group study is ideal. And so there's, you know, weekly questions, small group discussion, mm -hmm. and it's been uh, very well received. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. I'm going to put a link to that in the video description. So Great. folks, uh, and I'll put a link to the commentary as well. So depending on your level of Bible nerdiness, you can opt yeah. for one or both. Uh, but we the goal is to put resources in the hands of viewers um, because there is there is a hunger or to use your image, there is a thirst yeah. for biblical knowledge. And it's not always getting quenched by what's out there. So we want to yeah. point people whenever things do come across uh, that are worth knowing about. And, and I would say that that Chronicles is is a, I mean, it's up there with Leviticus, maybe Obadiah in terms of books that people know are in the Bible, but don't have firsthand familiarity yeah. with. Uh, th there is the second Chronicles verse that everybody quotes, and especially politicians. The one I just quoted. <laughs> yeah, that's usually the, I think that's the only verse that people, <laughs> most people know that's from right. Chronicles. And, and they usually don't get the context of it right. Um, no, that's so, right. So, and that that's a um because another a number of the uh of the studies pick up some of those terms, mm -hmm. but second chronicles seven fourteen, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves pray, I would just encourage the um the listeners to read second chronicles thirty with Hezekiah with the Passover, because mm. that is a commentary. That's how you do that verse. Mm. It's not actually something that gets prayed in your, you know, pray for the land. It actually is the hard work of reconciliation. It's fascinating. And and not one person is doing all the actions. There's several people, including God. Yeah, that's wonderful. So Second Chronicles 30. Chapter is, 30. Chapter 30 should be read 
when you're reading chapter seven and that's right read that verse jump to chapter 30 that's a good that's, that's right. a good nugget for the viewers i love that's it. a good tip <laughs> yes hot tip well let me let me transition to uh talk about casket um yes. i've recommended this book before and i'll tell you why i recommended it and then i want you to tell folks a little bit about it yeah the, the the primary strength that I saw in this study in Casket was better than anybody else I've ever read. I think you do the best job situating the prophets within the kings in a sequential way that people can follow. Yeah. The kings and the prophets, northern kingdom, southern kingdom, it all becomes a jumble in most people's yeah, minds. Hard. Even people that read, study, and teach the Bible full time, yeah. you have presented it in casket you've presented it in a way that I, I to this day i haven't seen anything that matches that particular aspect um put if you struggle with understanding where do the kings and the prophets fit in and, and the overall flow of the narrative this is the book i recommend first over all the others so tell us tell the viewers what is why is it called casket why does it come with this thing and uh or what is this yeah. thing? This, you know, very nice. Tell us a little bit about this as a study and where how it came. Yeah. About. So casket empty, first of all, is an acronym to help you learn the Bible. And I have taught uh, the Old Testament for the past 20 years. But when I first learned it, it was hard putting the whole thing together. And I was teaching uh, in when I was in England for a number of years and I was teaching at a church and they asked me to teach the Old Testament. I'm like, okay, how am I going to do this? So I felt like the Lord really gave me this acronym at the time to separate it into each week and the acronym. And let me explain what that is. Yeah, so the it, acronym casket. casket empty, I'm going to give it to you now. Mm -hmm. So the acronym casket empty is a memory device to help you to learn the storyline of the Bible. Casket is for the Old Testament and empty is for the New Testament. So it's creation, Abraham, Sinai, Kings, Exile, Temple. So it's casket. And then empty, Expectations, Messiah, Pentecost, Teachings, Yet to Come, which is Revelation. Mm. And so the acronym casket empty points to the death and resurrection of Jesus at the center of the biblical story. Right. But on a very practical level, uh, the what you just saw in terms of that timeline is that there is a visual timeline that goes through creation, Abraham, Sinai, Kings, mm -hmm. Exile, Temple, and puts all the biblical pieces together. And just, there we have it. Yep. There we have it. <laughs> it. And I have students who have um, taken the class with me that say to me, oh, I've still got the timeline sitting on my wall. I still pull it out all the time. But we also have a Bible study that goes alongside this. So there's the study guide that you just saw. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Bible study is 18 weeks going through the Old Testament and then 14 weeks through the New Testament. A number of churches are using it for discipleship. And you basically have four weeks. Uh, each week you have four chapters of Bible readings with about 10 to 12 questions. Mm -hmm. And it really takes you through the storyline. And what I do is I really highlight the most important passages. Right. And I think that's what makes it hard for people sometimes because, you know, you read the book of Genesis. Okay, what are the most important texts in there? Right. And people can't always get that directly themselves. And so I go through each one of the biblical books and really highlight, if you want to know only two or three things about this book, you have to know this. And, and it's been a great blessing for people in the church. Mm -hmm. We also have Bible study videos on the Casket Empty website, free videos you can just watch on the Bible studies. So really our, go our goal is just to help people learn the storyline of the Bible and see that Jesus is the fulfillment of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have wonderful responses from people throughout, and it's been translated in seven different languages uh, so we really got a real global mission with this as well. Yeah, it's it's great. The the content is good. The way it's <clears throat> we do so shameless plug disciple dojo. We have this Old Testament timeline mug, and this it's was fun. is very similar, uh, less detailed than the casket empty timeline. Yeah. But the but the concept is people need something to 
hang, they need a clothesline to hang the clothes on. They need That's a right. entry into it. So if you give, I, I like analogies. I like to think of with the Old Testament, it's so daunting because I mean, the, I, I, I tease my New Testament friends like, oh, it's, it's like a third as much material uh, yeah. or a quarter of the material that you have to master. But in reality, um, the Old Testament, it can be a labyrinth because it spans millennia yeah. and where the New Testament is like a hundred years. I mean, the New Testament has its own challenges, but the Old Testament yeah. challenges are of a different mm. nature historically because you're just having to wrap your mind around world empires, families, right. genealogies, rise and fall of kingdoms. And yeah. so if you can give people a frame and yeah. and and like the edges of a puzzle give them the edges and then they yeah. can start filling in the pieces on their own i think casket and I, I i haven't done empty i haven't done that part of the study i have yeah. done casket um i think that it does just that i think that it gives people a framework so that the old testament is not as intimidating yeah. as it otherwise is because you're learning the story of god's people which culminates in and it is intimidating it, right, it is intimidating yeah, oh, for sure. people, and the books are not in chron all in chronological order. Yeah, how do you understand that then? Yeah, yeah, it can be maddening. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, and again, that is that's what I appreciated in particular about your study in those parts where it does get confusing, which is the 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 mm -hmm. uh, the monarchy of Israel. That's when people <laughs> usually, I mean, that's when I have the most struggle, and I've been yeah. teaching Hebrew Bible for twenty years. It's it, it just, folks, no, you need to know about it. You need to know. I'm going to put the um, links to where you can do right. the study online, where we yeah. people can learn more about it, because there's a there's a lack of Hebrew Bible knowledge among the church. Um, yeah, and, and, and I'd like to think of it, too, that, um, you know, we tend to, with the Old Testament, take selective Bible verses out of context. Right. And some, you know, some of those, of course, like the Jeremiah that God has plans for us for good. You know, there's some good passage, wonderful passages. But then we can also take passages like Deuteronomy 28 and the blessings of kind of prosperity, mm. which was under the Mosaic Covenant. And we don't even sort of think through where are we in terms of the covenants and how right. does that fit with the new covenant and with Jesus who went to the cross, right? Mm -hmm. How does that impact this storyline? But we just take the Bible verses, and again, there's some very popular books out there that say you just have to declare it or just have to claim it, and assuming that somehow our words are like Genesis 1, words of creation, I'm like, I don't think so. <laughs> but we wrongly take the passages because we don't know where they fit in with the biblical right. story. Right. And then we wrongly apply them. So that's what I think setting that larger narrative context is very helpful for people. Right. Um, and then it they can then do their own study of individual books, but it's setting it in a larger redemptive context. Well, you bring up a really good point, and this is something that, that I've talked about before on the channel with other guests is when the idea of that we can speak things into being and and it gets carried to extreme uh the, the tongue is powerful the tongue creates life and death and metaphorically speaking your tongue i mean you i think uh esau mccully he said in a recent video he's like i've had my whole day ruined by something i read on the internet about me uh yeah. words can really ruin our day words can right. cause damage but where that gets taken to excess is what you just said when when people are told oh just declare and decree certain things and i've always thought and you can tell me if you agree or disagree or want to nuance it to me that's magic that's what oh, in the ancient world that's what magic did incantations yeah. were saying the right words knowing the right name to call the god to get them to yeah. respond yeah. It, it, it's it just seems pagan Am I yeah. off or yeah. would you? Yeah, I would, I would say it's false teaching. Mm -hmm. and, and the danger is it sounds Christian. That's the danger. Right. right? The, the danger is it sounds Christian and is a Bible verse. And what's wrong with quoting the Bible verse? And, uh, you know, Deuteronomy 28, God's going to bless you with increase and, you know, or you're going to be the head and not the tail. You need to claim that. You're going to be the head and not the tail. Well, mm -hmm. What difference does it make that Jesus was crucified? And mm -hmm. and how what is it difference does it make that we are called 
to take up our cross daily, that Mm. sounds like we're being called to be the tail, not the head. Mm. So we have to think through theologically how these passages relate. God's word is effective. Absolutely. Right. Right. And he's the one that is bringing things to pass in accordance with his will not we're to we're always to pray we're always to ask him but it is according to his will and his purpose Mm -hmm. and uh, and of course what happens with this blessings and these things you have to proclaim no one takes the curses they just take the blessings so it's very selective (laughs) (laughs) that's true that's true they the the um the jeremiah passage is always fun when people quote that but you know i know the plans i have for you and they always stop before the idea of of well this is going to be captivity for the rest of your life and your children right. are going to grow up in a foreign land and i'm always like oh finish finish reading it if we're going to claim right. these so, promises we got to claim the whole promise <laughs> yeah that's right so we're very selective cafeteria style yes exactly well th- bring it bring it around to us um if you don't mind whether it's uh, let's let's go back to chronicles um <clears throat> how do you read or how, let me say this how should christians at the big picture level read chronicles as christians yeah. uh, not just gathering information and not just building their biblical worldview although i am a huge proponent of both of those things yeah. but with the purpose of what what would that be in in reading and studying chronicles? What should their what sh- what should the tell us be when someone yeah. starts to study these so two I th- books? I think chronicles is intending to call us into a deeper relationship with God, mm-hmm. and that deeper relationship is prayer and worship. And you know, granted, people could skip over chapters one to nine to get them started. Right. Chapter 10 is also the death of Saul. So maybe start with David. Right. Mm. But so, you know, come back to those and come back to those at the end. But look at the stories of the kings and what are some of the things that we can learn from their lives that we're meant to be? Because the Chronicle is going to give you a little mini sermonette. So you're going to see them in there. Mm. What are some of those takeaways? Look for things like prayer, seeking God, um, humbling yourself, looking for those key themes um, throughout the book. And um, what Chronicles is going to do is want to capture our imagination, mm. give it, give us a vision of the kingdom, a vision of worship of the Levites are so important. So a vision of worship and also remember that when the church gathers together, we call that the ecclesia, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That that is not a new concept, that it is used throughout Chronicles, when they gather together, it's called kahal, the assembly. Mm -hmm. The Greek translation is where we get ecclesia. Right, right. So in other words, you're getting a picture. There are hints, like I mentioned with Hezekiah, 2 Chronicles 30, there are hints already of the gathered people of God for worship that is anticipating what we're going to do for New Testament church. Yeah. That's a so great I think that's point. one of the themes that runs through worship, singing to the Lord. Uh, that's a great point to to emphasize because I don't want viewers to have missed what <clears throat> Carol just said that the word that we the, the English word church is a translation of the Greek New Testament word ecclesia. That's that right. is the word used in Chronicles to describe the assembly of God's people. So sometimes you're something right. like there's no church in the Old Testament, and I'm always like, well, actually, right. no, there very much is. It's yeah. the people of God in covenant with God gathered together. And they gather together for worship. Yeah. And God does something. God shows up when they gather together for worship. Mm. And in our context where we're prone to kind of want to try and do something online, these kind of things, we need to be in community, gathering together prayer and worship. And this is a vision that's being set forth in Chronicles. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love that. Let me ask you one more question and then we'll we'll let you go. We're coming up on about an hour. I want to ask a challenge that people have when they read the Bible and the narratives in the Bible, the challenge they have is what is descriptive and what is prescriptive, Right. Uh, because it's very easy to read a story and go and do thou likewise. When in fact we may not be supposed to do what is the the story may be giving us a negative example, but it gets confusing because sometimes in his ministry, you know, like Jesus would say, oh, don't you remember what David did when he yeah. did to, to justify or to give precedent for his behavior that yeah. he was doing? 
So that can get pretty confusing for Christians. Do you have any tips or any general guidelines or just advice on how do we navigate yeah. what is prescriptive and what is descriptive? Yeah, that's, that's a great point. So Chronicles uh, does have descriptive and prescriptive. Um, so Chronicles is going to give you some cues of behavior that you're meant to be following and behavior you're not meant to be following. Okay. And so there are some, uh, because it's kind of got this sermonette idea, mm -hmm. um, you do see which, oh, which of the kings that you're not to do what they're doing. Yeah, you you do see that because there is this um, rebuke by a prophet. There is um, some God sending prophets to either bring exhortation and encourage God's people mm -hmm. or is sending a prophet to rebuke them. So that helps you. Uh, in Genesis, for example, it's more difficult because you have some of the things with Abraham when he lies about his wife and there is no intervention with God saying something negative and you're like, what is that? So that's a more difficult one. Mm. Chronicles is a little bit easier in that sense. Uh, but I think you always want to look for the New Testament as the grid. You don't want to only look at the Old Testament, but you want to look, are there any cross references here in the New Testament that will let me know is this still valid or not? Mm. Uh, an example would be some of the food laws, mm. right? So that um, that was prescriptive. It's descriptive, but it was prescriptive for God's people. But then we can look at the New Testament and see that, no, there's a change that's happened when it comes to food laws. So that's a place where you're looking for the New Testament example. So scripture mm. interpreting scripture. Mm. Good advice. Good advice as always. Well, is there anything that we haven't touched on that, that we need to hit before we close about Chronicles, about Genesis, about Australians living in New England, anything? <laughs> no, I, I, think, I think it's wonderful that you are digging in deeply to the scriptures because I think we're living in a day in which biblical illiteracy is increasing yeah. and um, we need to be teaching our kids the scriptures we need to be studying the scriptures ourselves. And and I, I always want to encourage people, it's okay if you have to work hard. It's just okay. Right. You know, uh, that's sometimes what you have to get the study Bible out, get the markers out and do the work with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Lord promises from Chronicles that if you seek me, I will be found by you. Mm. That's That sounds very New Testament. Some people might say, oh, well, that's in the Old Testament. I thought yeah. Jesus made that up whole cloth. <laughs> yeah, it's all in Chronicles. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I hopefully just through, you know, just getting to hear a little bit from you and 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 getting to see you and have a, they, now, they not only have a face to go with the name, they have a voice to go with the name. That's right. Um, every Bible study sounds cooler in an Australian accent. So folks, follow Dr. Kraminski's work. Yep. Um, check out what she's doing, especially uh, Casket check out the Chronicles commentary, the Chronicles study that she held up. I'm going to put links to those all in the video description, but uh, Dr. Kaminsky, thank you so much. It's great having and wonderful um, to be here. Yeah. I love talking with, especially a fellow Gordon Conwell uh, connection that always, and I, and I yeah, love your right. bookshelf behind you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yes. Yes. There's folks check out superhero seminary. If you want to know what all these yeah. uh, guys behind me on the shelf are all about it's not just my love of 80s nostalgia action figures. Um, there's a method to the madness here at Disciple Dojo. <laughs> but thank you so much, uh, Carol. I have a great rest of your week. And Thank um, you. And yeah, I'm, I may try to bring you back here for another chat sometime here in the dojo. Bye. Great. Well, great thank to be you. here. Take care. So again, I want to thank Carol for coming on. Uh, so great having her here at Disciple Dojo. Check out her work. I'll put links to the commentary on Chronicles and the casket study and the Bible study on Chronicles. All that is in the description below. If you appreciate this, once again, we would appreciate you subscribing to this channel if you haven't already and telling other people about it. Like videos, comment on videos, share them with people who you think are into Bible nerdy stuff. Anything you can do like that really helps this channel. But that's all for now. Stay tuned for more here at Disciple Dojo, and as always, keep training.